Well, thank you for staying with us. Thanks to Rick Wampo for with Spots. He will be back on Monday with a round of everything that will happen over the weekend. Right now, though, we have uh, an important conversation. The spotlight is on Ivory Coast today uh, on our show because of what's happening on Saturday. President Alassane Ouattara is vying for a controversial third term. His candidature has caused unrest in the country. The UN has expressed concern of ongoing violence that has in recent days left at least seven people dead and more than 40 injured, according to the authorities. Uh, opposition candidates are maintaining their policy of civil disobedience and reiterate their request for international mediation. Uh, the two main opposition candidates uh, announced the boycott earlier in the month, and I'm talking about their election. There are so many things, uh, Ben, surrounding this Ivorian el election that's uh, unsettling. Uh, that also puts fear in us. We know there are people, the reports say that they're going out of the main city centers to their villages. Mm. There are people who are also crossing, even though the borders have been shut. So we definitely must put the spotlight on Ivory Coast and talk about what's going to happen in this upcoming election. Well, especially as they are in our sub-region. And I'm sure those videos from 2010 are still fresh in your memory and how, you know, Laurent Gbagbo, so to speak, was dragged out and all of that. We don't want uh, similar scenes. In fact, Laurent himself had wanted to, uh, you know, contest this time around, things not panning out as he had planned. But I think it, it's only glaringly obvious that the people of Ivory Coast want peace. And, you know, that practically is why we see some of them now fleeing uh, to Ghana, which is seen as that bastion of democracy, peaceful country, 80 of them crossing into the western region. Of course, we'll be speaking to Justice Beidou uh, shortly on that. But uh, very worrying developments. And perhaps the most worrying piece in that puzzle, Alassane Ouattara deciding to go for a third term. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a five-term system. So 2010 to 2015, 2015, I mean, he won by a landslide, about 84% of the vote. Why he wants to go again, in 2016, processes were initiated constitutionally to amend and make provisions for him. But interestingly, in March this year, he had indeed said he wouldn't go again. All of a sudden, you turn after Prime Minister Koulibaly, who was supposed to be his successor, passes on. Mm -hmm. We just pray for peace in, in the Ivory Coast. We don't want any turmoil there. Absolutely. Let's engage our guests, Mr. Emmanuel Bombande, Senior Mediation Officer at the UN. A very good morning to you, sir, if you can hear me. Thank you so much for your time. Hello, good morning, and good morning to all your viewers. Great. The issue of Ivory Coast and the polls on Saturday, um, bring it all together for us. I mean, we're here in Ghana. What happens in Ivory Coast certainly should concern us uh, because of the 2010 situation. Now we're told that there are people who are leaving the city centers and going back to their villages. Uh, what do you make of the polls on Saturday and uh, the fears that people are expressing appropriate? Well, um, thank you for inviting me to uh, contribute and, 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 and to share with you. Uh, what we should uh, appreciate is that tomorrow, which is Saturday, uh, the polls will open by this time in La Côte d'Ivoire, but the country will be as divided and probably, uh, let's even say, they will be in a worse situation going into uh, these 2020 elections than they were uh, in the 2010 elections that led to the violence that you have been summarizing with the background uh, on your screen. Uh, let me quickly uh, put it here that in the studio, you have raised the issue about the third term um, effort of President Ouattara to present himself again as a candidate. Uh, what I want to quickly say is that though in 2016 he initiated processes for the constitutional amendments that you spoke about, number one, uh, there was never a consensus within the political stakeholders of Côte d'Ivoire for those constitutional changes. And number two, the provisions that were made that then created the position of a vice president, that created a Senate. Their combined effect with the constitution that elected Alassane Ouattara, in other words, preceding 
even the 2015 elections, did not in any way suggest that he is legitimately uh, positioned or has the legitimate right to contest a third-term presidency, except that his argument is, since it's a new constitution, in other words, an amended constitution, it, it therefore implies that I can have the right to stand again. But explicitly in even the constitutional amendments that we made, he will not be able to have the legal standing to justify a third term. But be it as it may, as you rightly put it, it is not possible to disconnect the events of 2010 with the events that would that have already started. In other words, even before the elections begin tomorrow morning, they are flawed. And you must add on to that the civil war of 2002 to 2007, which really made the country to be totally divided along the fault lines of the northern part of Cote d'Ivoire and the southern part. The northern part headquartered in Boaké. And so you had a physical division of the country, and that physical division was then accentuated by exclusion. Exclusion at the ethnic level, exclusion sadly at religious level between Muslim Islam and I mean, uh, Muslims to the north and, and Christians to the south. And all this, I would summarize in saying, Cote d'Ivoire has not totally healed or reconciled. Though there was a reconciliation commission that was supposed to have worked diligently uh, along the way it was abandoned. And it's like there is a fresh wound, and that wound only on the surface looked as if it is healing, and you are now uh, bringing to bear, <coughs> excuse me, on that wound, a new scratch that probably is going to deepen that old wound and make it to hurt more. And that is why you are absolutely right in saying that for us, the implications are huge. Keep in mind, we're talking about the third largest economy in West Africa, but you're also talking about the Côte d'Ivoire in which you can have a good expression of the presence of the whole of West Africa in terms of how it is cosmopolitan, in terms of how uh, in its history it has been a center of economic growth that then attracted literally everybody in Francophone West Africa to rape. And now you have a situation uh, that begins tomorrow and it is very, very difficult to see uh, how this will uh, pan out. Well, Mr. Yes. Bombande, uh, this is Ben here. I, I just want to find out, in recent days, there have been some violent clashes in places very, very much like, uh, you know, very close to Abidjan, including Dabu, for example. What do you forecast in respect of, you know, that? Should we, though it is not the right thing to expect, based on these, should we expect some eruptions uh, tomorrow? especially on the back of that, should we expect anything similar to what we saw in 2010, owing to the violent outbreaks recently? Uh, it's very interesting to see uh, and to observe what is happening, because as you rightly uh, described the position of the opposition parties, their attitude is to go fall out in a civil disobedience uh, posture. What basically the also trying to suggest to the international community is to promote non-violence and that the non-violence and the disobedience would force uh, Alassane Ouattara and his ruling uh, party to uh, rethink their position on this. But we can go back as you have, you have given some of the incidences of the violence and to suggest that even if the position is one of civil disobedience, and you never know how that violence then could erupt. Now, the situation is so tense that you can never predict the extent to which the violence cumulatively now begins to snowball and, and, and to roll over, precisely because of the conversation we are having that links 
to the previous incidences of violence, not just in 2020, but going back into the civil war and into the election. So violence is possible. To what extent it could be a large-scale eruption, it will be very difficult to tell. But one thing we can all put our finger on is that the division goes beyond the politics and mobilizes people alongside the supporters, basically of the RHDP, which is Alassane Ouattara's party, who basically is bringing people of one side of the country. In other words, the, it's so difficult to always repeat the division. You, you feel like you don't want to talk about it in that sense, but that's the reality. The people of the North, who are also in numbers, uh, more of uh, the Islamic religion, versus what you see now as the Bete, who are those who rallied around former President Laurent Gbagbo, and the Boile, who are basically those uh, rallying around Bédier. And to that extent, we see ourselves in a situation uh, that uh, is not going to ogre well. If you were to allow me to add on to that, I would have framed it in a question. What is the point going to the polls tomorrow in La Côte d'Ivoire when the situation is such that violence is likely? Uh, would it not be a wise decision for these elections to be delayed, postponed, and for the country to rally around through what you yourself discussed in the studio about dialogue and mediation, and to find a way forward before the elections are organized. And the reason I add this at the tail end is simple. Because once the elections are organized, you, you go into the zone of no return. People will now begin to talk about the legitimacy of the elections that would have been organized. And we're talking about the one for tomorrow. And so you are going to add on to the issues that we are uh, discussing, the fact that an election has been organized. And yet, there will be serious issues around the legitimacy of the elections tomorrow. Mm. And, uh, and uh, the reason I keep on coming back to those legal issues is simple. Imagine that our own institutional arrangements at the level of the African Union and ECOWAS are violated by a certain government. Mm. Basically throwing out the sense of justice that must prevail. And what you then see happening is that the Constitutive Act of the African Union, the, the, the articles of the Constitutive Act try to look at the issues of promoting peace, security, and stability on the continent, promoting democratic principles and institutions, popular participation, and good governance. All these have been thrown out of the window. The opposition has gone to the African Court for Human Rights, and they have had a ruling, a ruling that basically says, look, you cannot throw out uh, the 40 candidates the way you did. The Constitutional Court, that is seen to be the highest body to legitimize elections, is so partisan that it no longer plays its role at, as a court. That happened after the 2010 elections. It's happening again. So what you have simply seen is a reversal of rules so that those who were the victims in 2010 are now the perpetrators and we have the perpetrators of 2010 are now the victims mm. and it is sad that even other bodies that are outside africa such as the european union are suggesting that they recognize the international justice pronouncements that have come out of the african court and yet an african member state it's rejecting those decisions by our own courts. Mm. And that tells you the gravity of the situation we are in. Mm. And for our viewers, the response of the government of Cote d'Ivoire was, okay, then we will, re we will withdraw our status of recognizing the African court uh, 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 for people and human rights. Mm. And so we have a situation in which it is the exertion of power on the ground and who wields the power, who determines the way forward. Mm. But violence is such that you can never uh, calculate your position based on the power you have. Mm. The power you have will be nothing compared to the power of the people should they decide to go in a way 
uh, that will be very violent across the country and spill over now into neighboring countries, and we are one of them, and the rest of West Africa as well. Yeah. Mr. Mombande, I, I hear you say that this exercise has no legal basis. Uh, basically, it is flawed, even before, you know, the people of Ivory go, go to the polls tomorrow. Uh, the ECOWAS has sent a delegation this week to Ivory Coast. I wonder why either ECOWAS or the AU or other institutions are not reiterating the point that you make in terms of let's hold on to this exercise. Let's have some conversations, especially because of the tension and also the violence that is, is erupting already in the country. Why is nobody holding this position and why is Ivory Coast continuing uh, on this path? I, 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 I res your, your, your framing of the issue resonates with me and I totally share uh, in your thinking. I have sought to advise and uh, uh, the good thing about the rules that some of us play, my role is to advise because I'm not in any decision-making capacity. And uh, uh, in that advice, I seek to prevail upon the type of thinking that suggests that one, yes, dialogue, Mediation is very, very important when we are confronted with this type of a situation that is uh, almost a stalemate. But I also add that sometimes dialogue can validate illegality, create more frustration, bring about more stress, and therefore legit legitimize violence. Because we cannot say let's talk and let's talk. And when we are talking, we are legitimizing what is illegal when the, the legality in itself does not assuage emotions. Because we are human beings and, and people naturally, men and women, have emotions. There is a point and a line in which uh, when there is no reasoning, uh, people's emotions take over. Yeah. And that is the point mm -hmm. of no return in the type of violence that can be cruel. And so I will absolutely agree with you in saying that. Then what is the point in the investments of so many years? And I'm talking here beginning with ECOWAS. Go back to our experiences of December 1989, when we were confronted with Liberia, and how that informed an intervention that was very difficult with Ghana playing a leading role. And that by 1999, we agreed on the first treaty, which is the ECOWAS Protocol on Peace and Security, to put it uh, broadly. And then complemented in 2001 with the Protocol on Democracy and Good Governance. And then on the other side, at the continental level, I talked about the Constitutive Act in 2000 and some of the political efforts that we've tried to engage in. So try to calculate the enormous investments as a people in the region and on the continent. But keep in mind that when we're talking about these investments, look at the cost of the wars that were fought. And then what you then ask yourself is, what is the point having these arrangements and treaties and protocols when they are not respected and when they cannot be respected? So there is this sense in which we don't even respect our own statutes, our own rules and regulations. Now, you cannot have an election in which one side has determined the rules that govern the elections and will go ahead and organize the elections and win it and completely do not care about how the, how the other side feels. Not only is that already Ill illegitimate, but it promotes violence. And so... I, 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 and I think you two in the studio, it's, it's not as if there is a response to this, but we are rather saying it appears we've not even started. It appears that, and that for me is where there is so much regret, that when we thought we made so much progress, what you are seeing in 2020 is a reversal of that progress. And I know that your focus is on uh, Côte d'Ivoire, but you know that there is Guinea, uh, that is equally in a bad situation. And so the whole question then is, what does all this mean in a West Africa region that truly has been recovering from the worst forms of civil war 
and now literally preparing to go back into these wars uh, because of these political issues and disagreements. I want to cross over and bring our colleague in who's been monitoring the situation on, uh, you know, some towns sharing border with Ivory Coast. Justice Beidou is our colleague who joins us also with that perspective. Justice, a very good morning, if you can hear me. Uh, you've been monitoring the situation with people crossing over into Ghana, even though we know that the borders have been shut. Bring us up to speed with what mm. you've been monitoring. Uh, good morning, Mamavi. Uh, for many of the communities along the Ghanaian Ivory Coast border, it's a situation of uncertainty, um, especially because people are aware that this uh, very, very crucial election is happening this weekend. And uh, on this border uh, with Ivory Coast, there's a, a major refugee camp where uh, more than a thousand people that came in into Ghana following the war of 2010 uh, still live. And within the last few weeks, um, my information as I've been here is that there are many, many more people who are using unapproved routes, uh, crossing or over the river that divides Ghana and Ivory Coast uh, to get into Ghana because uh, at the Ivory Coast side of the border, many of them are being turned uh, back. I've been in the camp uh, these last few days trying to find out from the people uh, what they think and what they think would happen uh, following the election that is expected to happen tomorrow. Uh, and, and this report that is going to be playing now is, is what I've been able to put together, Mamavi. Let's watch. Inside this church building made of raffia, hands are raised in prayer. Hallelujah. It's two days before presidential elections in Ivory Coast. Ten years ago, when a similar poll happened, more than 3,000 people were killed. Those here were part of the thousands who fled for their lives. They have been living in Ghana since then. I just pray. It's two days now, I didn't sleep because I'm fe I fear for my family. This is the Ampain refugee camp. More than a thousand people live here. It's one of three that were built to receive Ivorian refugees during the country's war of 2010. And for my country, if the election was not passed well, it means that I'll do maybe 10 years again. Natasha Baibo is showing me photos people have sent her from home she claims these are pictures of those who were butchered on the streets of Abidjan for protesting President Alassane Ouattara's decision to run for a third term. It's two days now I didn't sleep because I'm fe I fear for my family. They are free. They are free. And most of my friends, my sisters call me. They want to come. But they close the border. So they don't know where they can pass to come. Many of people, when they reach the border, they can't pass because they don't have money or they just told, tell them to go back. They want to save their life and they tell them to go back. It's not easy. Many of the children playing on this field today were born on this camp, hundreds of kilometers away from their motherland where their parents fled from bloodshed 10 years ago. A lot of them do not even speak any French at all. The refugees who live on this camp are praying against the situation that will birth another generation like this one. Children cut away from their roots. And whether that happens or not depends on the result of this election. Even for the people of Ghana, it's not good. It is not good. You know when it starts, but you don't know when it ends. So to me, if situation gets worse, then I will open the doors. What we are thinking on now, 
we want to know if the borders will be open. If the border is not open, then it will be difficult. Four people are contesting for the presidency in Saturday's election. More than 15 people have already been killed in violent protests since August. With the stakes that high, many are concerned what the future of this country will be. Justice Beidou, Joy News, Ampain Refugee Camp. Well, quite a situation there and very interesting dynamics to grapple with. A pretty worrying scene when it comes to the Ivory uh, Coast. But Mr. Bombande, wrapping up on the conversation, uh, just two things I'd like to uh, run by you. Now, we hear that some of these people, out of fear, uh, you know, owing to what is happening, have indeed uh, crossed uh, over to Ampire in the western region of Ghana. Uh, now, our borders are supposed to be shut. How exactly that happened, uh, we're not fully aware. But what does this signal and what can be done to prevent, you know, an overflow of people c crossing over into our country? Yeah, thank you so much. First of all, what we should be doing in Ghana is not to allow a dilemma to present itself to us in which we are forced to choose between A or B. And you know what a dilemma does is, whichever you choose, you still have a problem that you have not resolved. I, I, I think that uh, we now need to begin thinking very fast and uh, very quickly about how you deal uh, with what is an emerging situation that is not good. Now, first of all, it's important for your viewers to appreciate that we are currently the chair of the Mediation and Security Council of ECOWAS because we are the chair of the authority of heads of state in which the president of Ghana is a chair of authority. Now, when you read the text of international humanitarian law and international human rights law, if you try to look at what all these things uh, mean when you interpret them, we must, as an obligation, provide the right of entry to people whose lives are threatened by violence and are therefore fleeing their own country and looking for safety. You cannot say that because of the COVID rules in which borders are closed, we must keep the borders closed simply because we are trying to respect COVID-19 rules when a population is under threat of violence and for that matter looking for safety. It will contradict uh, international uh, human rights and humanitarian laws. So what that does is create a corridor that is legal so that refugees can be received and taken care of in the protection of their lives, which would then resonate with African Constitutive Act articles and also ECOWAS protocols. So this will be at a humanitarian level. And you do this in partnership, and you people, thank you in the media, uh, join news for the wonderful work, bringing into our homes the reality as it is. And whilst that humanitarian dimension is being dealt with, you can continue to pursue the political, hoping that the political resolution of this conflict will allow a situation in which the violence will not go back to the 2010 scenario, in which you can now have a new confidence that will receive less refugees because the political situation would have dealt with it, and that these refugees might be willing to go back in a shorter time than they did before. Mm. Okay. But why? Right. We, yes. So this will be, yeah, if yeah. I were to put it as a wrap up of a broad summary. Great. Right. Mr. Bombande, the election is just tomorrow. We'll have plenty of conversations. Uh, in the coming hours. We appreciate your time and your analysis this morning. You're still watching the AM show. Stay with us. When we come back, what don't you know? What do you think you don't know? Well, we remind you of what you don't know. Stay with us.